Good evening. I'm Jeff Badnock, and on behalf of the University of Montana Alumni Association and the Community Lecture Series Committee, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome you to the final lecture of the 2023 Community Lecture Series. This series, now in its 25th year, showcases some of the outstanding faculty here at the university and the work they do in advancing research and learning. We will begin with the university's statement of acknowledgement. The University of Montana acknowledges that we are on the aboriginal territories of the Salish and Kalispell people. Today, we honor the path they have always shown us in caring for this place for the generations to come. These lectures are being video recorded by our friends at MCAT, Missoula's Community Media Resource, for later cable cast and posting to YouTube. And I did check YouTube, and the first lectures are up. So if you want to go to the YouTube channel and, and revisit any of these lectures, you can do that now. Um, and they come up every Tuesday. Later during our Q&A, we will be handing around microphones to capture questions from the audience for those watching over the internet and for later cable, cable cast. Please take a moment now to silence your personal devices. Tonight is our final lecture in the series and I would like you here and at home to begin thinking about the series and what you enjoyed about it and any suggestions you have for improving it or for lecture series topics for next year. We will be having a reception following tonight's lecture and I invite you to speak with me and others on the committee about your thoughts about what would make a good series next year. The seal of the University of Montana features a hand holding high a torch and bears the university's motto, looks at Weiratas, light and truth. Our university is a place where students come to study, learn, and conduct research in an effort to pursue light and truth for themselves and for others. The university's efforts at supercharging this effort was recognized this past year when it was awarded R1 designation as one of the nation's top research institutions. It would be daunting to provide you with a lecture series that touched on all the areas in which the University of Montana faculty are doing research that earned that award, but we are happy to present a series where you can gain some appreciation of the world-class research that is going on across the campus. For the final lecture in the series, the committee has selected Julia Galloway, Professor of Ceramics and Drawing in the School of Visual and Media Arts. Julia got her BFA from Alfred University, a place, incidentally, I lived for a couple of years, and I had a question, is the sub shop still there? <laughs> okay, wonderful. It is. It's, it was a great place. And her MFA at the University of Colorado. She is recognized in the national art and ceramics community for work that is both innovative and instructive. Recently, Julia was named a Fellow of the Council Award from the National Council on Education for Ceramic Arts. The NCECA honored Galloway for her dedication to professional development, creativity, and transformative contributions in the ceramic arts. Julia is recognized by her colleagues as an artist, educator, and activist as she uses her art to call attention to serious problems the planet is facing. Please join me in welcoming Julia Galloway as she presents her lecture, Ways of Knowing, Ways of Discovery, Ways of Art Making. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, that was lovely. You guys hear me okay? Can we turn down the lights a little? I feel very uh, in the spot here, when really, let's look up there, way more interesting than me. I just want to thank you guys for coming tonight. I think that. Um, you know, I'm going to go for about 40 minutes. We have a little over an hour kind of set aside, but I'll try to, you know, brevity. There's something to be said for that. But I appreciate you're giving me your time to come here tonight to hear about my research and what I'm interested in. And I really appreciate it. But you know, time is precious, especially I have a lot of fabulous students here today. And uh, thanks for coming, you guys. You can be a little late, just a <laughs> little, not too much, just a little bit. but. I'm so happy to see you guys. And you know, sometimes as a teacher, it's all about this. And then my studio work is all about this. And it's not that often, actually, that those two sort of overlap. I did love hearing about how my colleagues in research were working with their students so closely in their own research. And it's making me sort of reconsider uh, really my teaching and the relationship with that in my research. 
So listen, tonight I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, well, what, what research is. Like holy moly, for an artist, like that's so big. Like the whole, like my life is research, it sort of feels like. But I do have this bias about research. Like I think research is like science. Like A, you do some tests. B, you do some tests. C, you do some tests and then you got somewhere. And then you figure out what to do with it. And I have to say, as an artist, it's like this. A, F, oh, C, B, B, here we go. B, 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 like that, right? So I just think it's like, like it's so intergrained. Making, being an artist and the research for my work is so intertwined, you know, with my work that people always say, <clears throat> are you going to work? And I'm like, I'm going to my life, actually. Do you know? So, uh, so I think there's, it's just a complete enmeshment. So in getting ready for this talk, I thought, I'm going to tell you about what I'm doing. And we'll see what you think. OK? All right. Oh, I should have tried. Oh. oh, first test. Nope. Aha. Uh -huh. OK, so one thing I was thinking about a little bit about research is the relationship between goals and outcome. And uh, how did I sort of get started being an artist? And what is the relationship between the goal? So the goal for my life is to honestly make pottery. Like, how esoteric is that? I mean, that is like way out there. But it sort of is, you know? And then how do I evaluate the outcomes? Is it personal satisfaction? Is it how it impacts the world? Is it how these pots move out into the world? Are they still relevant? Does anybody care? Do I care? Right? So I think about things like that. So how did I get started being an artist? I don't think anybody wakes up and says, I'm going to be an artist today, and then goes and does it. I think it's more like being an artist just consumes you. You just sort of are doing it. And, and then there you are. It's kind of just like that. So anyways, I started making pottery when I was in high school. I was sort of a very serious kid. And uh, that was my wheel. Right up there is a photo of my wheel I bought with my babysitting money. And I lived in a five floor walk up in Boston. And I would carry that incredibly heavy clay up all those five stores. And then I would um, make pots in my, between my bunk bed and my dresser. I had my little potter's wheel stuck in there. And my mom was like, she thought it was fabulous. And I thought it was fabulous. And then I'd bring my pots um, down to high school to be fired with my teacher, Mr. Lane. And I named my wheel after my high school teacher. So, uh, you know, that was, that's about as good as it gets. Anyways, I'm sorry, the next slide is a mistake, but uh-oh, what did I do? Hold on. Okay, here we go. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, my mom was sort of uh, early in the women's movement, very active. And um, she would also t often take me to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And that was sort of her babysitter. So uh, Saturday morning, she'd take me to the museum. She'd drop me off, five bucks for lunch. And I would just hang out there all day long. And then, you know, at like 5.15, she'd come and pick me up. I'd be sitting outside. And so I would walk around the museum and look at all this fabulous stuff. And in my mind, I would make up all these narratives about the work, like what was happening with that little girl, and why is that pot six feet tall, right? And then I would look around, and I would look at these things, these like very beautiful, beautiful objects. And I mean, I was a kid. I didn't know anything. You know, it was so great. And I'd be like, well, I'm going to have one of those at my house when I grow up, and I'm going to make that, and I can make it better than that, you know, that wonderful, fabulous arrogance of youth. And like that, uh, this uh, <clears throat> kind of white jar on that side, that's called a moon jar. And I remember thinking, that jar would float. If I was swimming, that jar would float next to me. I thought that was so beautiful. And then I thought, could I float in that jar? It's so interesting, right? So when you're just walking around the museum all day, your, your brain gets pretty busy, you know? And so I spent a fair amount of time in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston when I was growing up. And something in all of that love of objects and kind of the fantastical narrative of objects and how beautiful objects come into your life and the importance of beauty, somehow that all got ingrained. And somehow in all of that kind of swirling together, I became a potter. So in making pottery. Why is it important today? And what are my goals as a potter? So why is pottery important today? I, to me, it's so obvious. It's, it's hard to talk about. But what I would say is that the, more, uh, that the act of the hand, that a handmade object, has a different kind of value. People would say it has a different aura about it. I don't know about that. That's pretty up there. But I would say that a handmade object is invested with a different kind of value. 
And that's what I'm interested in. And I do know that for myself, when I'm hanging out with handmade objects, I take better care of them. I don't recycle them. I don't, they're not disposable to me. And so there's something about the um, importance of what you have around you, how it affects the quality of your life, and living with beautiful things, I think is a, a very reasonable thing to consider. So is it important to make pots today? Well, I, I don't know. What I would say is that contemporary pottery is exploding in our culture. That was almost a joke. <laughs> oh, not quite. But anyways, like, like three pottery studios are opening in Missoula this month. So there must be some need for something. So when you can go buy a mug that works just fine at like wherever, Walmart, blah, 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 you can get six for a buck or whatever the, all that stuff is, why would you spend time learning how to make a dish off that you eat off of? I would say it has something to do with nourishment, aesthetic nourishment, artistic nourishment, some kind of connection that we're looking for. What are we looking for? So what are my goals of the potter? Honestly, to have a rich, full life and make beautiful things for people. It's that simple. It's gotten a little more complicated recently because I'm very worried about the condition of our world. And that always complicates everything. But I think that's it. So now about making work. I'm going to do a quick <laughs> pivot here. And I just want to mention my uh, student, Emily. Emily Mauvais is a graduate student, she's a fabulous graduate student. And when I was thinking about research, well, I understand what scientific research is. My sister's a scientist, and she's, she just measures the blossoms on these flowers all day long. And that tells her how, as the plant is slowly migrating, it's changing. I can understand that as research, because you have like a ruler, right? And then you type it into a spreadsheet. Aha, that's what research is. OK, check. And I'm like wedging clay, like, is this research? I don't know. But anyways, I have this fabulous graduate student, Emily Mulvaney. And she is working with her inspiration comes from uh, microscopes. She's looking at all of these very bizarre little things uh, in a microscope. And then she's projecting the images that she's seeing in the microscope onto her sculpture. And so since she's involved with science, I think that's research. You know? And boy, did that make me realize how biased my understanding of research is. And how sometimes when I feel like arts are always sort of like over here a little bit, we're always sort of, you know, da 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 oh, in the arts. Da 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 oh, oh, in the arts, right? That's how I often feel a little bit like over there, you know? And then I realized I'm projecting that bias also. When I thought research, I better talk to Emily because she looks in a microscope. That's hysterical, actually. Anyway, she's doing great work. Her show will be next spring. If you get a chance to look, I would encourage you. But now we'll talk specifically about research. So I'm a potter and I make cups. And how much does it hold? Well, I like if it holds a whole can of something or half a can of something. And if it's a foamy thing, then that cup might need to be bigger. OK, check. All right, then, so that has to do with like how people actually use them. What do they put in them? Right? Is this for cereal? Is this for gumbo? You know, like I think about those things. I consider the viscosity of melt, this viscosity of pouring, you know, in a teapot. Like, how's that working, right? And that's so direct research. Does this thing out of my hand fit in your hand, right? That's so direct, right? And then there's things like, well, what is it going to use it for? And how's it going to live in your house? And is this something that is full of potpourri that sits on the mantel? Or is this something that goes in and out of the dishwasher? Is this the bowl? Is this the mug that's been like rolling around in the back of my pickup truck for six months? Maybe a little coffee in the bottom. And then some of them are very specialized. Like this is a salt and pepper pot. And this was made exactly to fit on your stove. So sometimes I have to take location into consideration, how it's going to be used. And then, of course, there's always the firings, the different kind of clays. Oh my god, don't get me started on glazes. Like, what makes a glass melt, and why, and why is it this color? That's like a total humongous pursuit. And then, in addition to all that, there's all these ideas in pottery. So one of my favorite things to make are cream and sugar sets, which this one is. And here you can see sort of the ideas already, right? Like on the sugar bowl, there's letters written in a grid. And on the creamer, the same thing is written in script. And thinking about the different sort of thing between when letters, when a word is typed, when it's emailed, when it's texted, when it's written, block letters, script, when it's whispered, when it's shouted, right? 
all of that sort of helps me figure out what I want my work to look like. But the best thing about cream and sugar sets is that the uh, creamer's job in this world is to pour out nourishment. It pours out cream, it pours out milk, you know, soy milk, oat, whatever, yes? And the sugar bowl's job in this world is to contain sweetness and to hold that sweetness dear. I think that's so beautiful. I think that's, I think that's like a lovely, these two ideas come together to make one idea. That's a very beautiful thing. So anyway, so we have with all these pots, how they're made, why they're made, where they're made, their ideas in them. And do they reflect where we live or not? How are they related to where we live? This is the scissor-tailed flycatcher. And I did a whole series of work where I was drawing all of those, uh, you know, those beautiful, beautiful watercolors by John James Audubon. You know, they're just the most, oh, wow. I know that guy's a very complicated person, but his drawings are just so beautiful. So I made all of these cups with uh, the drawings of John James Audubon on them. And I did that because I wanted to learn how to draw, and I wanted to learn how to see those cups better. So much of being a potter is about seeing. You think, oh no, it's about the hand, it's about touch, it's about domesticity, it's about physicality, all of that is true. But some of it is really about your eye. You guys, the next image is completely out of order. This is Emily's work. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I kind of snuck her images in right before the talk, so. There you go. But um, I think that uh, Emily says, my research takes place in both the studio and the micro microbiology, microbiology lab. And I love that so much, right? And I would say, for me, my research takes place in your kitchen, in my kitchen, in the studio, in the classroom. And then I would say it also takes place out in the world. In 2009, I moved to Missoula, Montana. And I moved here to teach at this fabulous school. I had been a visiting artist about six or seven years before. And I walked into the pot shop. And if you haven't been in it, you're all welcome to come. And it's the old ice skating rink across from the pool. And you walk in, and this expanse of space opens in front of you. And I remember being a visiting artist, and I walked in, and I thought, anything could happen here. I want to teach here, because there's space. Oh. So anyways, I was teaching in New York, blah, 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 blah. And a job opened here. And boy, did I pull out all the shots and was very luckily hired to come teach at, be director and teach at this fabulous school. So <clears throat> anyways, when I moved to Montana, I was so stunned by how much my posture got better. Because when I lived in New York, I was always looking down. And then I moved to Montana, and I was always looking up. And I think I grew an inch. I just, it was just astounding to me how beautiful this was, this place. And I thought so much about whenever I go to school, I spend all my time looking up. And the only other time in my life that I spend looking up is when I go into a temple or a church or a mosque. And that's all about looking up. And I thought that was such an interesting idea to make work that was about looking up and how to define that. So I started to really work with this idea of clouds. And so this is a dinnerware set. And it's clouds sort of floating through the arches of a church or a temple. And this would stay on your uh, dining room table. And then when it was time to eat, you'd pull them out, you use them, you wash them, you put them back in this tray. So this is simultaneously uh, you know, a decorative object that would sort of um, uh, like be beautifully displayed and also a very useful one. But mostly I was sort of stunned at how beautiful it was in Montana and that the clouds defined the space. So I started to work on all these pots that had clouds on them. And I, you guys, I have to say, these cloud shapes are as stupid as you can get. I mean, these are like Charlie Brown cloud shapes, like doink, doink, doink. I mean, really, like as far as an artist, are these high on creativity? Not that much. But there's something about using that glaze. I'm using this glaze that runs. I had to make a glaze that really moved. So the viscosity of that melt, so that, that cloud is running, right? That cloud is running and pulling it out, and that's helping to find the space. And this is where the marriage of process and material is really joined with idea, right? Like, how do those things come together? And here are some clouds that, you know, you guys in Missoula will know this, but when the sun is setting and it shoots under the clouds and all the clouds become gold. So that's what these cups are based on in some sort of relationship of abstraction and containing. So I really love this idea of putting these clouds on these pots so that basically I was making pots that represent where I now live. I thought, this is great. This is like taking the outside, wrapping it up, putting it on the inside. That's not unlike drinking coffee, actually. 
a way. But uh, anyway, so I started to work on these plates full of these clouds. And I had this show out in Great Falls, which to me, coming from New York, was like another planet, right? And I got there, and I was like, wow, this is really different place. Oh, it's real. It's pretty interesting to me. And the farmlands just stretched out in front of me so beautifully. And the sky just opens up, and those clouds just move back and back. And I thought, what can I do about that? So I went home and I made about 540 plates. And uh, I made them all different sizes. There was like tiny dessert plates and large serving platters. And then I went and I, then I hung them up in the museum. And I had a show at Paris Gibson and it was this beautiful old school. And uh, so here, there, here I am up on the ladder starting to hang these plates up. And I hung them from wires from the ceiling. I put a grid up in the ceiling and I hung these cloud plates down. And um, it was a lot of little strings of wire you know, and uh, it was three wires per plate going up, up to a little hook in the ceiling. And uh, what was so wonderful is there's uh, the, that museum is very active in the community. Here it is. And this museum is very active in the community. And they went and they got all of these um, uh, people that sort of were in trouble, like on probation in high school. And uh, they helped me cut the wire. And that was fabulous. And they got really into it. They're like, yeah, that wire is too short. And then he's like, Julia, that cloud is crooked. You know, and they were like really telling me all about it. That cloud is too, no, no, no. And it was like so fabulous, like the skin they had in the game. And then at the opening, they all brought their probation people, right, whatever that was. And they were all like, I hung up these. Those are mine, you know, which is like, like oh, you live here. Oh, you live here. This is where you live. You live in this gallery now. Right? In that great way. So these plates were all hung up in groupings, and then there was clouds on the wall, so that you'd really have this whole installation. Now, you guys, the show was actually quite dark. I had to light it a lot to get the photos. But it was very dark, and I turned off the heat in the room, so the room was very cool. So you would walk in, and it would just sort of be this cool, quiet room, and these plates would slowly come into focus, not unlike dawn or dusk. And you would sort of, they would slowly sort of come to you, and what I was so interested in here was that the opening, when I had all these folks come to the opening, I made these little teeny plates that people could eat um, snacks off of. In a reception, you have to bring snacks. And so I served local food on the plates, which was representing where the farmers worked, right? So there's this sort of full circle here. But I have to say one of the most beautiful things of this was, here are the wires from the plates that really look like like we, there's a storm out here. You can like see it. Like This is not true in Boston at all. You're just surprised, or in New York. And these strings really pulled you forward. So after the show had been up for about a week, the museum called and said to me, we'd like to put a bench in the room. I said, great, go for it. And then a week later, they said, we'd like to put another bench in the room. And I was like, fantastic, load it up. And uh, it turned out, and I came in, and there were these benches up against the wall. And um, it turned out that, and this is terribly sort of gender bias of me, but it was my experience, was that the, um, uh, the, f the f farmer family unit would come to the museum, and the, uh, generally the gals would go into the museum shop to do a little shopping, get a scarf, get something from the, right? And then the farmers would mostly sit in their trucks, right? And then somebody sort of said, you might check this out. And so the farmers, instead of sitting in their trucks, they would come sit in this room, because it was sort of familiar, which I thought was like, just so fabulous. Anyways, when I went and took down this show, I was packing up the plates and I had to repaint the wall. And I noticed all these dark spots on the wall. Not too dark, but they were about like, about like that. And they're kind of a couple lower and a couple higher, and mostly just on one wall. And I was like, what the, what is that? What is that? And I looked at it and it was over where the bench was. And the farmers would sit there and lean back and that was like a little bit of grease from their hair on the wall. That's like the best research ever. <laughs> I don't know how to quantify that, but somebody spent some time in that room. And I was like, that is fabulous. Right? That is so fabulous. So the next project I want to tell you guys about is the one that I'm really involved with right now, and it's called the Endangered Species Project. And it was really rooted in three different experiences that came together. And one was this bird called the Wandering Albatross that I'll talk about. Another is an artist named Akio Takamori, who's a real hero of mine. And the other is the AIDS quilt. So this is the wandering albatross. 
and it has an 11 foot wingspan. So majestic, yes? And uh, I was in the Minneapolis airport um, trying to find gate C. And uh, when I was listening to this podcast about the albatross and I was not paying any attention to where I was going or what I was really listening to, that kind of classic spacey artist, 100%. And, um, and I heard about this albatross that would go out and it would fly over the um, ocean for a month to uh, get fish and then it would come back and regurgitate the fish for its young. And it was a month. And they said, well, half of its brain falls asleep while the other half is awake. I was like, oh, I need that. But anyways, um, and then they said, and they are currently dying at the rate about every five minutes because of decapitation and drowning from fishing. And I lost it. My little like um, barrier that keeps things from coming in too quickly or deeply was not there. And I pretty much sank to my knees in the middle of the airport and was just completely overcome at the rate of this loss. It's not that often that I get that lightning bolt, and that was definitely one of them. And I thought, OK, girl, what are you going to do about this? Come on, Missy, what are you going to do? Right around that time, this fellow named Akio Takamori <coughs> was a very well-known ceramic artist was working on his last show. He was sick with cancer. And he was doing a show, and all of the work was based on imagery of public figures apologizing. So this is the Chancellor of Germany apologizing after World War II. And, um, and he also, and here's uh, the, chant, the uh, leader in Japan, and then this is Ronald Reagan um, signing an apology for the um, internment camps here in America. And I thought that was really quite amazing that this man would spend the last three months of his life making work about apology and remorse. That seemed very profound to me. Like, what do we have to apologize for? And I don't mean like, I'm sorry I missed your birthday. I mean like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And so what I have to say, especially to my students, is that the Endangered Species Act passed in 1973, and we knew how to recycle by 1975. Clean Water Act was 1972. My generation dropped the ball, and I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. We blew it, and we're leaving you a mess. Lastly, the third main influence for this project was the AIDS quilt. <coughs> and the brilliance of the thing that's so tricky about AIDS is that people didn't see it unless they were in the gay community, right? I mean, sort of family, but it was all distant, right? And it wasn't until ACT UP got involved and they made this group, the AIDS quilt, that people sort of started to really realize about AIDS and started to put research and money into the funding. So this is an image of the AIDS quilt, and it just blew me away. And I saw it, and it just was so profound to me. And what it really said to me was, when you can't see something, it doesn't totally exist. So you can't really make change until something is visible. So that's where this came from. So you put all those things in a mixing blender and think about my research, and I decide that I'm going to start working with endangered species. And these are the endangered species of the continental United States. And I first started by making these plates. I wanted to make commemorative plates. So these are the endangered species of Pennsylvania. And they are uh, drawn on these plates, and they have silver on the background, so that when you looked in the plate, you saw your own reflection next to the species. So I just sort of wanted to show you, like, here I am drawing on them, and they're all, uh, like, stacking up on the cart. And on the back of the plates, uh, there's the back and the front of the plates, and I'm doing a, a technique called um, O inlay. So I'm inlaying the drawing. And then on the back of each plate, there's an essay, and that's my niece researching the essays for me, uh, why the species is having a hard time and what can be done about it. Because it has to be informative. Endangered species with no information is just a buzzkill. So the plates that were silver in the background were still endangered, and the plates that were gold were recovering. That seemed important to bring those both. So <coughs> here we have the bald eagle, which is now delisted, which is fabulous, and the western chorus frog in Pennsylvania, which is having a hard time. So I just started to work on drawing all these species. And it was very exciting. It was a different way of working. I was not concerned about if this fit toast on it or not. Its function was different. Its function was educational. And so here this is, this is in a show in Pittsburgh, and this is my sisters helping me hang up all these pots, these plates, and they covered the whole back section of the gallery. 
And so when you walked in, you would see all these plates on the back wall of the gallery. And you're like, oh, shiny, pretty. Oh, blue and white, pretty. Oh, animals. And you get all excited. And then you'd read the title. And you'd be like, oh, not so exciting, right? And so here we had this show. And by the time people sort of got to the end of walking by this long wall of the endangered species in Pennsylvania, they were crushed. And so somehow in there, we had to have some sense of action. And so that's why I started to put all that information on the back of the plates. Now, the plates seemed good. They were interesting. Um, but it wasn't enough. It didn't have enough punch. And they weren't pretty enough. There was something, there was something there that wasn't quite enough. So I don't know when research fails, but I know that here, there wasn't enough. So I started to research burial urns. And the, culturally, these burial urns have so much power. Like the visual power of this object seemed like amazing to me. So I started thinking about these urns quite a bit. And I thought, I'm going to start making urns for species. Right? I want to make this thing visible. So I called the crematorium of Missoula because I wanted to know what ashes, like how big do I make these species, right? Like, I, I, I don't know. Anyways, I called the crematorium. I told them that my grandmother had died and that I had to make an urn for her. And they said, well, how tall was she? And I said, five foot seven. And they said, how much did she weigh? I was like, 120. And uh, they said, was she in good health? Not really. She died. And then, it should, and then, and I was like, I could just tell that they were backing away on the phone. Do you know, I could just tell I was blowing it. Because you guys, uh, my grandmother died a very long time ago. So I, I just, I said, uh, honestly, I got to be honest with you. I, I, I'm doing an art project. And, um, but I didn't want you to think I was crazy. And she said, a little too late for that. <laughs> And, uh, and she said, why don't you come on down to the crematorium? I can clear she's sussing me out. So I go down to the crematorium, and they pull up all these urns. And I think that I should make species. And the ash mass will determine the size of the urn. So if I'm going to make a wolf, it's going to be about a cup of ash. And if I'm going to make the beluga whale, it's going to be like this humongous urn. Well, I thought that was friggin' brilliant, right? But anyways, um, this gal in the, at the crematorium, she said, I said, how do I figure all this out? And she said, well, I can tell you're a visual learner. That's what she said to me. I can tell you're a visual learner. Go get couscous. It's just like ashes. I was like, oh, OK. So I went and I got a big bag of couscous. And there's like this whole mathematical thing online that you can figure out how big the urns need to be. I was like, fantastic, right? This is what I need. And then I look at my list, and like half of the list is like clams and moths, which would be like, you guys, not even a quarter teaspoon. I'm like, this is not going to work at all. Like, forget that. So I decide I'm going to make the urns human scale, which is average about a gallon. So then I start to work on these urns. And I have to say, I'm a really great decorator. I'm not great at rendering. So I had to really learn how to draw. I had to go take a class on drawing. You would think, after however many years of art school, I could do it. No, I had to go take these classes. And I went down to, and I, I took class here, and I took down at the, and I always was sitting next to the high school kid. And uh, they would always say things like, that's a very nice color. And I was like, oh, you're trying to butter me up. But uh, anyways, so I started working on these urns. And I thought that I would start by making urns in New England. Because <clears throat> I'm from New England, and New England has a very clear uh, geographical um, identity. So these are the urns for New England. And here they are going into the kiln. And uh, here I am packing them up. I'm very proud of that. And packing up these pallets of um, pots and shipping them to New England. And this is a show at Harvard. And so when we got there, we packed the gallery really full so it would be overwhelming how many urns this was in New England. And um, I have to say it was pretty successful. But what I thought I was learning and what I actually needed to know were really different. Like, what's up with that, right? So I thought I would learn like, how to display these things. No, really what I learned is who comes to the gallery, right? So I hung out in the gallery. And you know who came? Homeschoolers, scientists, people. Um, Anth people that study bugs, they were way into this. Entomologists, they were like, it w they were, and they would tell me kind of what was wrong, which actually was just fine with me. Like, this beetle is really not that color, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and um, so um, scientists came, uh, home homeschool scientists, hunters. You guys, there's not that many hunters in New England, but they all seem to show up at this gallery in Harvard. And then um, uh, environmentalists, activists came, 
And then like the North American Wolf Society, somebody from them came, they introduced themselves. I thought, wow, I didn't even know there was such a thing, right? And um, so it was sort of this stunning show that told me what kind of legs this project would have. And that that was my job now, was really to figure out how I could move on forward. Now let's see, if I can do this, great. If I can't do it, this is a little video of the show. We'll see if it plays. So um, well, the reason why I picked New England, is anybody here from New England? Like we have kind of an identity, right? Like we are, we are not from the East. We are from New England, right? We are barely from Massachusetts. You know, we're from Boston or New England or Nashua or Bangor, maybe. So anyways, this is just a quick clip of the show, but I thought it'd be great to work with that really specific identity there. So, <clears throat> and here we have a couple of these uh, species. Let's see if I can do this. There we are. And um, so what's sort of interesting about them is that I could put like where they live and how they sleep and what they ate. Like, do you know what, I know what um, um, frog scat looks like. Yeah, yeah. So we talk about research. Has anybody ever researched what frog scat looks like? It's the most ridiculous thing. But then suddenly I had to learn all this stuff so I could portray these species well. So I think that that was just the kind of research that I just was really surprised at, do you know? Like, um, like when I do a fish, does it school? Then I have to put a lot in one urn. Is it a fish that hangs out by itself? You know, all those things. As a potter, I've never needed to know about frog scat. It's sort of a new area for me. Anyways, I also st um, started a website where I had um, information about these species on there because information without information, you know what I'm saying? There's nowhere to go for that. So here are a couple of urns from that show. And um, it was pretty interesting. One thing that was very difficult was doing species that are creepy to me. Like um, this uh, stone cat has like a lot of stuff falling out of its mouth all the time. That's like gross. You know, and, but you have to look at these species for a long time. Like there's the leech, like ooh. So somehow I had to get out of my own way so that I could see what was there. And like snakes creep me out. So I thought, can I make this snake creepy on the urn? I hope so. So somewhere in the middle of all this, it seemed satisfying, but I went to China and I learned how to carve. And I worked with this master carver in China and she um, didn't speak any English and she would hit my hand when I did it wrong. And you learn so fast when that happens. So anyways, I started carving these urns and, uh, and there's something about this that has more presence than the drawing. And I think that they're really, it's pretty exciting what's happening with these. And this is exactly what I'm working on right now. And um, so this is a flower urn and these are gallon size. And they're a little bit more in the traditional urn shape. So <clears throat> this is what I'm currently working on in my studio and I have 1,256 to make, and they fall into categories of threatened, endangered, extinct, and recovered. And it's just the continental United States because I want it to be species that are familiar. When somebody said, I haven't seen a doodle bug in a long time, then I know I have you. Or when somebody says, when I was a kid, when the geese flew over to Canada, or when they flew back, there was 60 and now there's eight, that's when I have you because suddenly it's come into your life differently, right? So that seemed really a fabulous way to go. Like, how could I do that? So anyways, these are the urns that I'm working on right now. And um, this is uh, a, uh, for a species that's gonna be extinct. So I'm trying to figure out a little bit about what kind of clay to use and how to differentiate those different categories. So how does all of this become involved with the world? Who are my partners in this project? And what is the relationship between research and action? There's a lot of artists working with environmental issues. This is Bradley Clem, and he's a fisherman. And he was so stunned by the level of pollution in the ocean that he started to incorporate that on the surface of his ponds. This is Bradley Brandy Cooper, and she works with only second source materials. So all of her work is made out of clay that's dug out of the sink traps, old sheetrock that was in the dumpster, like this is something as an artist I have to think about. If I'm concerned about the environment, I have to pay attention to this. This is a potter, Lindsay Rogers, and she works in clay that she digs out of her backyard. That's a little too backbreaking for me, but I sure appreciate her labor. She makes these very beautiful pots. So talk about regionalism. Oh my God, that's like regional, like her backyard. This is Lisa Orr, and she's a new potter coming out, and she uh, clearly missed one of her images, but she has invented a kiln that you can fire 
with um, one shopping cart worth of wood. That's like amazing. So we just built this kiln at school with my fabulous students who are here. And then we have, this is one of our alumni, Rachel Jones, and she has this project going with um, her students. Uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is out of order, but this is the kiln that um, Lisa made. Uh, she had a project going where her students, she made these seed containers, and she takes local seeds and she puts them in these containers and then she buries them in the ground. And that's to ensure biodiversity over time. Because that pot will stay in really good shape for a long time, but probably in about 50 years it'll crack and then we'll see what comes up. So individual artists are doing this, working with these ideas and also groups. So I'm part of a group called the Green Task Force because I can't stand up here and talk to you about endangered species without actually doing something about it, right? So there's a whole group of us that are trying to figure out how to work with ceramics in a way that's more environmentally thoughtful. One way is wild clay. This is outside of Phillipsburg where there's this fantastic local clay. And uh, it's mainly being harvested by a teacher in uh, Bozeman, Josh DeWeese at MSU Bozeman. They have a group called Wild Clay. And then this is uh, down in Red Lodge. This is David Hiltner. And he has a tree planting project. And every time he fires a wood kiln, he plants a tree. And it's not like that tree is going to go in that kiln. It's much more sort of you know, larger than that. But I think that that's pretty interesting. So when I think about these things of action, what has had the largest impact on me, and how do I go forward? And I think that I always appreciate people like this, like Greenpeace started very early and their job was to witness, right? Their job initially was just to witness the harvesting of whales. And you know, whales, by the way, are doing okay, not great, but they're doing better than they were when Greenpeace started, right? Um, but I think that that's interesting, the thought of being a witness. And in some ways, I see the urns as being a witness, like see this is happening. And then also, when ACT UP got involved with the AIDS crisis, this very interesting thing happened when it became super visible. So that's what I want the urns to do, is to become super visible. And lastly, this is um, Sonia Clark, and she is unweaving the Confederate flag. She's a weaver, and she's unweaving the Confederate flag. And I think this about undoing, like she's undoing. So in some ways, does this endangered species project have something to do with maybe undoing what is done? And I have to say, honestly, my apology is the first stance of some sense of undoing. And I also have to say, there's a little bit of humor in the project, too. Like when I have to draw the most weirdest looking spider ever, like 10 inches tall, that's a pretty weird day in my studio. Lastly, this is my clay body. And all of my clay is uh, harvested in the United States and is kept here. But I got a little bit concerned about this. And the, one of the primary ingredients in my clay and glaze is silica. So I found out where the silica mine is that my clay comes from. And it's an open pit mine, and it's in Illinois. And you can actually see it from Google whatever, right? That's the open pit mine where my clay comes from. So I looked around, and I gave them a call, and I talked to them. And they're a very normal company. And then I did all these searching, and I found a land trust that is right near where this mine is. So every time I sell a piece of work, 5% of my sales goes to the mine. I mean, I'm sorry, 5% of the sale goes to the land trust, which is next to the mine. And you guys, it's not very much. I mean, my pots actually aren't that expensive. But over time, it's really added up. And that's super exciting, like these little steps. You can do little, little, little steps, right? And also, now that I've talked to like, you know, every uh, land trust in, oh, in Illinois, I, it's kind of broadened my understanding of what a land trust is. Anyways, just so I don't leave you on a totally bummer note, I would say that it's not always a one-way trip for endangered species. Species definitely, come down, definitely can come off. Two things usually put them on. If we can solve one of those two things, usually they come off. So we recently had this bat come off. So now if I was going to make this bat again, it would have gold in the background instead of silver. And here is its urn. So I'm not exactly sure what all of this has to do with research, except for that I think research, and about, uh, research is about understanding and participating in the world. And that's what I'm trying to do with my work today. So thank you so much for coming. Oh, I think we're on the question and answer period now. I'll try to repeat the questions. Yeah. I'm curious, Julia. Uh, thank you, by the way. It was absolutely inspiring. Thank you very, very much. Um, somebody in the hard sciences, sciences would have their research funded by NSF or some other organization, mm -hmm. federal organization, mm -hmm. typically you know, that would fund trips to China to learn something sure. or elsewhere. 
How is your research funded? Yeah. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I sure can. You know, arts is just in a really different, it's arts is just in a really different place in the world, and that's part of accepting this as a career, is knowing that the few grants that there are are so competitive, they're almost impossible to get. Um, I mean, I think initially, um, uh, when I sell one pot, it pays for the next, right? So that's sort of one thing that's just true. Um, I have a teaching job, so that allows me to make work that I don't have to sell, right? So there's sort of a little bit of a balancing act on that. Um, <coughs> It's just different, and in some ways, it allows me to be very free. Do you know, I'm not, my work is not accountable to anyone, really, and that allows me to just really explore, do you know? And I think, you know, commodity is a funny word. Like, creativity and commodity, they're not great bedfellows, you know? But I do know that I sold a ton of those plates in Great Falls because everyone wanted that. They wanted to take that thing home. And that allowed me to explore the next thing. I'm a little bit lucky that I'm interested in pottery and that pottery is an um, easy commodity. You know, mug, mug, mug. Mug's like a kind of a gateway drug for ceramics, actually. Everybody needs a mug, you know? Um, I have been able to get some grants, which have been great. Um, but I do also accept that that's not the country I live in. And um, that, uh, you know, I kind of plod along like that. One thing which is awesome about making a commodity is I know when I left school I had kind of classic student debt, you know, and um, I had 544 teapots worth of debt. No problem. I could do that. It made it really manageable. So there is this sort of fluidity in that. And um, I would say since I do make a commodity, I have it much easier than some of my colleagues, Do you know, like large scale sculpture, large paintings. They have a much harder time than me. So I'm also a little bit lucky that people kind of like the pots, do you know? I kind of lucked out a little bit. My aesthetic, and I think that comes from the museum, is um, common plus, right? Common and a little, you know, like that. Does that help? Yeah. Any more questions? OK. And again, I'll just remind the audience, when you um, speak into the microphone, it's like an ice cream cone. Well, I don't know about the way you eat them. <laughs> I was intrigued by the relationship you had with those kids that were on probation. Yeah. Is there a way that art can be used to try to help those kinds of students? Was there any follow-up to that if you had such a positive response from those, those kids? Yeah, yeah. So, that's a, so the question was um, uh, that she was intrigued by the relationship with the kids who were on probation who helped me set up the show and if there was any follow-up with that. And I would say no. I would say that um, art is almost always intertwined with some kind of activity. Do you know, like there's all kinds of like art therapy and art in different groups and arts. Basically the arts, especially ceramics, is a place where people come together. Because there's something about ceramics, it's a little bit like a stitch, like a sewing group or something. Like you all come together and you work together and you need access to facilities. Um, so I have to say, for my project, that was not true. I do know that the museum has an ongoing relationship with those, that population. And so that, I sort of feel like, is their job. I think if I wasn't teaching, I would be more interested in some of these venues of ways of bringing people together. But um, my students are that for me. They take up that sort of um, real estate in my energy. So, but I would say that the arts really are, um, uh, the arts are a place where you can be almost any kind of learner and you might find something rewarding there. And um, there's something about the focus of making which is just different, you know. And having some product at the end that you have a sense of satisfaction with, I think that counts for a lot. Yeah. Great, good question. Other questions? Julia, that was simply wonderful. Um, help me understand as a non-artist, capital yeah. N, capital O, capital N. You bet. 
how much time do you invest in something like this urn? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I have to say that arts are so intimidating to people who aren't in the field. Whenever I meet somebody like on a plane and they say, what do you do? And they say, I say, well, I'm an artist or I'm a pilot. Oh, no, 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 I'm not creative at all. I couldn't do that. And I'm like, well, do you cook? Oh, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> you know? So I think that artists have this, um, maybe because of museums or whatever, there's, we have sort of this trip. Like you have to be really good. Or you have to somehow, art, creativity and art, something, I don't know. I know that there's almost nobody more creative today than the people who invented the Macintosh computer. That is the most profound. And, and the fact that they argued for three weeks about two clicks or one click, I love that. You know, artists have to be kind of obsessive, right? And my guess is that, like most people, I have a little obsessive of something. But you asked me about time, right? Time. So this is so interesting to me, right? Because I get this question all the time, all the time, all the time. And somehow, Time is equated with worth, right? If it took you 30 hours, it's better than if it took you 20 hours. Well, we know that's not true at all because it really took 20 years to get to the 20 or 30 hour mark, right? So we kind of, but there's something about people wanting to know how long things take. And I think that's really interesting, first of all, that that's a gauge of success. I kind of get that. I kind of can get that. The other thing, and this is sort of, I'm pivoting here a little bit. But I showed you guys the shows that had a lot of pots in them because often number of, number of uh, artwork also creates worth. Wow, 500. Wow, 1,200, right? When really, you're going to make 500 pots no matter what anyways, do you know? But to channel it into one show. So, but really, you want to know. Okay, these urns take a long time. And it depends on the species. Mammals, done. Whales, done. Mice, done. Plants, oh boy. So I work, I, I carve on three at a time. So, because if I look at the same images all the time, I kind of stop seeing it. So I'll be carving on one, and then I'll take a little break from it, carve on another, and I try to do a plant and then some other kind of species. Plants take the longest, and because they're so complicated and simple at the same time, and they're so involved with depth perception. Um, but I can do anywhere between two and six in a week. So my first show of the urns will actually be at the Missoula Art Museum. They're going to be my host to start it. And uh, the show will travel for 10 years. I have six other museums that are interested. And um, uh, 2027. And I'll just barely be finishing. I'll just be sliding into home plate. So I'm doing them alphabetically, and I'm on G. Now, C is the largest group, so G is really quite a, uh, I mean, how many I's? Like four? Yeah, nothing. But yeah, E's are fast. W, three. But M, a lot of M's. M will be the next big hurdle. But C is, that was a lot. Colorado, California, Connecticut, like all those. So, um, so that's how long they take. And uh, the truth is I go to the studio every day. Even if I just go for 15 or 20 minutes, it can carve a claw. But um, I have to go every day. So. so as I told you before, my favorite class in college was ceramics. But I don't know anybody that was in that class that even had a thought of making it a profession. Mm -hmm. And we all were practical. We're sitting there, how do I make a living at this? Yeah. And I'm, so I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One. Do you interspace how to build a business around your art mm -hmm. and not um, you know, lose the creativity? Sure. Um, and then two, how much for an urn? Yeah, good questions. OK. Um, so let's talk about the making a living question. Um, it never dawned on me I wouldn't. I never even thought about it. I just kept swimming in that direction. Do you know? And um, <clears throat> I was a sabbatical replacement for a year after graduate school, and I thought, I better be able to make a living off my work before I teach. So I took four years off and made a living off my work. And the amount I made my last year as a production potter and the amount I made the first year as a teacher was the same amount. I'm very proud of that. Um, I think that 
One thing that's a little tricky about art school is that we really do learn quite a bit of sort of uh, philosophically um, really following our ideas or our visions. And to take the public into consideration can kind of be seen as selling out. And I think that's a very dated notion. I think I can make small adjustments to my work that makes the work more approachable. I can do that, right? That's about my work living in the world, right? So um, I think that when I talk to my students about this, I say, first of all, don't get a studio on the side of a mountain with a German shepherd in a wood kiln where you're totally isolated. Do not do that for like, Get a website, <laughs> but um, always share your studio with people so you don't get discouraged, right? And then have a job that's a twofer. Like if I was getting out of school right now, I'd work at the good food store because they pay pretty well. You get health insurance and you get all that free food. Score, <laughs> right? That's great. And then that kind of allows me to make more of what I want. Um, the truth is, and I'll tell you guys this, a starving artist is a pejorative term and we hate it. So if you could resist that, that would be great. Um, because if you put that in front of anything, it's a little bit awkward. A starving dentist. Hmm, a starving writer. Hmm, a starving philosopher. There's something about that, right? And you only hear it in the context of starving artists. Do artists make very much money? No. Uh, is that their mission? No, or they probably wouldn't go into the arts. Uh, but I would also say that the profession finds us. Oh, how much for an urn? Okay. Well, I don't really know yet because none of these urns are for sale. The carved ones are for sale because it's all one show that's going to travel together. It actually fits an, about two-thirds of a semi, including pedestals, which is like so cool. Um, the uh, other urns, the painted urns, were between like um, 160 and 320, depending on the scale. So if you really decided you want one, you could do it. Uh, so talking about money is sort of taboo in art. I think you just got to talk about it. You know, otherwise it's this like weird thing that screws you up. You gotta stay away from that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, because if you don't talk about it, you end up going to museums. Oh, <laughs> but I think there is something. It's a lot of pressure to put um, commodity on top of your creativity. And I would say to all of my students, try, try to have a second thing. First of all, it gets you out of the studio, because we are studio rats, and it's not great for us to be in there 24/7. We got to talk to other people about our work, and the UPS man has no idea <laughs> what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? Like that is not the person I need to be talking to about pottery. So when you have a, si a side gig, right? You have a side gig. You get a little bit income. Keep your overhead as low as possible. Do not get a solo apartment in Missoula. Are you kidding me? No way, right? Keep your overhead really low. Make sure you don't get isolated, and enjoy your time in the studio, and try not to let the money enter too much. It's real, right? Money's real, you know, but I think you kind of have to. A friend of mine said, Jewel, you always have to put air in your money. It's like, put air in my money. But she's like, spread your bills out on the table so you can see them. Print them out and spread them out. Let's get the reality of what's going on here, right? Because the sort of um, fear of it is so much greater than how to make it work, right? 544 teapots, I can do that. You got it, right? Okay, what other? You guys got any more for me? Come on, bring it on. All my students letting me off the hook? <laughs> What's up with that? It's your chance to get back. Okay. Yeah. Could you just talk about the technique behind that piece, for example, the texturing and the color, and how do you do that? What, yeah. what are the steps? Yeah, you bet. You bet. I'd love to. So um, the first batch of urns were made in this shape, so they would resemble a bell jar because I wanted to have sort of that connection. And then after this batch, I was like, yeah, no, they got to look like urns. So that's why the second set of urns are a little different. So I throw these on a potter's wheel. And um, I probably use about four or five pounds of clay, which is about this much. And throwing them probably takes literally under 15 minutes. That's the very fast part. And then I would make the lid, and I'd get the pot, and I would let it sit out and start to dry a little bit. And then I do all of my carving with a broken X-Acto knife. Like I have an X-Acto knife and I break the tip off it. And then I have that really fabulous sharp edge, right? And then I start to draw and draw. And what I've done the night before is that I've researched this bat so I understand a little bit about it, right? And then I um, 
look at how it lives, how it flies, those kinds of questions. And then I print out a lot of images of bats. And I kind of have the images around me. And then for the primary images, I would um, cut that out, to cut the photo out, lay it on the urn, and I would trace it. Because I don't want to get distracted by the challenges of anatomy. I want to get there. I don't want to be like, yeah, that leg is too big, that leg is too small, that leg is too short. It's bending funny. Like, no, no, no. We've got to get there. So I just trace it, right? And then I slowly start to look at its teeth, those pointy little teeth. And then I start to carve and carve and carve and carve. Then I let it dry. And then I take this thing called underglaze, which are like clays that are all different colors. And I paint that on the surface of this one. And then I fire it. I wax over it so that it's protected. I dip it in another glaze, and I put it in the kiln. So that's pretty much the steps. And pretty much almost all my work is reductive. So I'm constantly scratching away. So and uh, it makes for a lot of little goobers. <laughs> but sort of, it might be clearer on, uh, let me just whiz back here for a sec. Just some urns here with some better senses of carving on them. But that broken tipped X-Acto knife is really fabulous because um, I can sharpen it with a Dremel tool and I don't, don't go through quite as much material. And um, here, you can really see it here where I'm scraping and scraping and scraping. And actually, these urns are going to stay white. They're kind of like bone. They have two shades of white on them. And um, the glaze softens them a little bit, and I want these to be sharp like that. So, OK, did you have a question? Yes. Uh, in response to an earlier question, you, you said that there's sometimes uh, y your final product was a little different uh, because of the commercial. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate on that, yeah. what, h how you, what, what things you would not do if it were <laughs> <laughs> just to be on your own uh, mantelpiece. Totally, right? Everybody has that line for themselves. Like we have this glaze called Paycheck Blue. It sure is, right? <laughs> so I think it, you know, um, uh, so for me, I can adjust size, right? Does it fit in your cup holder of your car? That actually, if it does, that's a small change for me to make, but it's going to allow you to walk around with that cup, right? So for me, I can sort of affect size and shape a little bit. And um, also, I would say that um, like that glaze that runs a little bit in those clouds, like people really love that. There's something about it that involves self-discovery, or they kind of understand it in a way. So maybe I would be more apt to do that on more pots than others. Um, when I feel like this is going to sell and I make it, it never sells. It'll sit there, like it doesn't have like a, it doesn't have pluck, you know? So um, what I can do, the way that I can adjust the best with still keeping the integrity in the work, right? Which I even hate saying it like that because then somehow wanting the work to be in your house means it has less integrity, that's crap, right? So um, what I can do is sort of figure it out and maybe make six instead of four or eight instead of six. Do you know, and tack on a couple at the end. And then it doesn't quite get tired. When I'm making work and I'm like, I've got to make some money this week, the pots look like really, really tired. So does that help a little bit? Yeah. Julia, everything you've showed us is marvelous. I, I, it's, it's fantastic to see. But I'm stuck on the plates. Yeah. <clears throat> I think, and so correct me if I'm wrong, Yeah. because I'm personally font challenged. Yeah. And I think you indicated or showed that on the bottom of the plates? The back, yeah. There's narrative going on. Yes. I can't get my arms around it. How is that done? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. Do you do it? I do, yeah. So um, the early ones, I would handwrite it. But honestly, my pen penmanship's kind of crappy. Yeah. yeah. So um, you can make a decal. It's like uh, I would type it out, and I would bend it like in Photoshop, so it would fit around that plate. And then when I printed it, I printed it on this um, printer that instead of that just jet black uh, ink printer, it has a little bit of glaze in it. 
and you can just print them out and you cut them out and you lay them on and then when you fire it, those letters melt into the surface. Yeah, I mean that's how, whenever you see any imagery on anything ceramic, it's always decal unless it's done by hand. So it's kind of cool, it's like this um, uh, clear paper on top of regular paper and you float it in water and you slide it off. You kind of slide this, it's cool, it's so cool. <laughs> You bet. You bet. Sure. Anybody okay. else? Yeah. Any yeah. other questions? Yeah. The question was for my students if I was entertaining in class or not. Um, I will just tell you honestly, uh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a different mission. Right? It's sort of a different mission. And so this presentation was put together to keep you guys awake and involved for 45 minutes. Right? And I mean, I think when I do PowerPoints about history or something, I can kind of pull it out. But when I'm in your studio talking to you guys one on one, it's, I've got a, I, I'm secondary. They're first. Right? So, um, I mean, I think I still have a little sense of humor. Just saying. Yeah, I know. You guys should answer it. But you're putting them on a spot in a terrible way. <laughs> you know. What I can say a little bit about this is that um, as a teacher, I have a few different jobs. As an artist, I have some jobs like getting work out into the world, slowly converting all of you guys to buying handmade pottery. Absolutely. That's one of my jobs here tonight. Um, to talk, to figure out what artistic research is and why I had my own bias against, you know, things like that, right? And then as a teacher, my job is to sort of listen for your potential. Like I have two superpowers, and one of my superpowers is that I feel like I can tell where a student's going a little bit. If I just let them, them, like you're not here, if I just let you talk it out, if I can stop interrupting you for a minute, and let you guys run, then I can kind of figure out where you're going. And then maybe I can be in front and pull a little bit. But this level of sort of um, conversation now would just be exhausting to you guys. You would just keel over. You know, It's not really sustainable over time. Um, so that's one of my superpowers. And the other one is um, I have a low gear. You know when you're working? Like you're working, you're getting tired. I have a low gear. I can keep going. Anyways, I think that the students mostly know what they need already, and my job is to make space for them to try it and to just screw up. Okay. You know, like, okay. And also to say, like, I understand the society's not really sure what in the world you're making, and I'm not sure I do either, but you should just try to go there. You know? I don't know. Is that true, you guys? You're shaking your head. Andy's not sure. I have really fabulous students here tonight. And I got to say, you guys, being a teacher is a friggin' awesome job. It's, a, it's, it's complicated. It's such a complicated job. There's so much going on. But I love it. I love seeing these faces up here. Oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? I, I love it when students disagree with me, even though it's so annoying. <laughs> you know, I love it, even though it's so annoying. Ah. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. So good. Are there I, in, oh, I was going to invite any other questions. Oh, yeah, let's wrap it up. Well, if you ever, ever need uh, a, an explanation for why visual arts are so important at a university, you heard it tonight. So um, we're all glad that you're here teaching our students. So this is, as I said, this is our final lecture. Can I uh, jump in just one sec? Yeah, you guys, would all my students stand up? All the students stand up? Yeah. Can we give them a round of applause for being brave? These guys are brave. They're making art today. Thanks for coming, you guys. Yeah, thanks, everyone. <laughs>